Hi everybody. When I make bassoon reads, I often listen to music. And in I wouldn't call it a New Year's resolution, but in the last few months, certainly, I've made a conscious effort to listen to more bassoon music or bas performances of uh, bassoon pieces uh, while making reads. And what I did recently was start to re-listen to a lot of the music of Jane Gower, who is a bassoonist. I'm not sure if you may know her, um, but she has done a number of CDs, including Donzi Concerti, um, and she has a group called Island, which if you look it up on Spotify, this group is sort of, uh, uh, I don't know how you say that, but two groups have come under the same account by accident. So you'll find a pop group with bassoon music um, in the discography. Uh, but in any case, she they recorded sort of those string quartet or string trios with bassoon music of the sort of late classical, early romantic period of uh, Donzi, De Vienne, Reich, uh, Cromer. Um, there may be another one. Uh, but in any case, most of these were recorded in the first decade of the 2000s, I think. And um, anyway, I was reminded of this uh, recently because a few weeks ago I played for the first time with a group called the Kölner Academy, uh, which has been around for a long time. It's a freelance-based historical performance orchestra doing a lot of classical romantic music. And uh, I was reminded by the conductor, um, Michael Will Willens, that actually it was the Kölner Academy who recorded the Donzi Concerti CD with Jane. And um, I should just say that, you know, I was very lucky as a young person when I, in a, let's say around, I think the first time I listened to the CD was around 2008. Uh, I think this was recorded in 2006. I can't remember exactly. I don't think it says here either. Yeah, 2006. And I was lucky enough that my high school and my university had a subscription, sort of unlimited subscription, to the Naxos Music Library. And the Naxos Music Library, what they do well, I mean, not every label is on that um, archive, I guess you could call it, but, you know, I made, I was constantly listening to it, listening to it because that was, it was totally free for someone like me, and I was listening to stuff that I you know, I was looking around for things to try and find out what I liked, you know, it wasn't necessarily listening only to bassoon music. Um, but I discovered pretty much all of Jane's performances there. And um, just a little bit about her. I mean, she's the one of the second generation historical bassoon performers. She came to Europe, she's Australian and came to Europe in the 1990s. And I think she's certainly one of like the great historical bassoon soloists. Um, who's alive right now, that's pretty much, I mean, they're all alive, <laughs> but uh, I think she's one of the greats, and certainly she was playing, you know, she was playing a lot of this sort of early, late classical, early romantic stuff, that's where you find a lot of the recorded repertoire, but there's a great CD also with Lars Ulrich Mortensen of Telemann, and there's, I think, um, I'm going to get the composer wrong, but I don't know if it's Bertali... Anyway, there's a Dulcian CD as well, uh, which you can find on Spotify if you look for her name, I think, rather than that group, Island. Um, in any case, I, I listened to a lot of, of that music, you know, and I first listened in 2008. And here we are 15 years later, you know, and for the first time I actually get a physical copy of the CD because the, the conductor, Michael, when he he told me that, oh, yeah, we had recorded this. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I never made that connection that um, it was this group that was like the orchestra that that, you know, backed her in this in this CD. And what was really interesting to me, you know, Naxos, you know, Spotify, you get the cover, which is just, you know, often you get the CD cover, which is just a picture. Um, large enough that you can see maybe the label on it, but you don't actually get to um, look through the booklet or anything. And Naxos Music Library is much better. Um, you often get the booklet available in PDF when you, when you look at that, when you're listening to the music, but not always. And I didn't, I don't remember if at the time it was possible for me to look at the booklet 
buy a Naxos music library of the stuff that I was listening to of, uh, of this. Um, and in any case, what I found, you know, that there's a longer conversation that I would love to have on this channel, but with someone else, not just me talking to you directly, uh, about CDs and the expense that we have to pay and then now that it's and we're sort of moving away from a physical product in terms of how how it's distributed although everybody who makes a cd gets a physical product gets a physical object and i in many senses it can feel wasteful having all of this stuff which is actually manufactured and it's made of plastic and that and the fact that most people are going to listen via streaming, um, except for this older generation who are still sticking to buying physical CDs, um, you may wonder, you know, you may think, what what is the purpose of this? I'd like to have explore that conversation later in another video, maybe. But what I really benefited from on the topic of this CD in particular is that just the other day, I was sitting down at the table and I just opened the thing and I, and I was explaining to uh, my girlfriend that, you know, what, what it was like um, to re make this realization that actually Kulner Academy, which I had just played in, they recorded this CD that I've been listening to, that I've, I've known for 15 years, you know? And I just opened the booklet and, you know, you can see uh, some photos of the thing of the thing and I was just a bit curious because I always thought incorrectly that Jane was playing on an original instrument I thought she was playing on an original Severi I don't know how I got came to that conclusion or whatever but even what's funny though is that you don't often you would look in the booklet for this and it's in the booklet but it's also in small print on the bottom of the back end of the CD you can see um, it's it says in German, um, bassoon, colon, a copy by David Mings of a Buhner and Keller instrument, Strasbourg, circa 1806. And, uh, which is sort of like, this is an ATNOZ instrument, um, what he's recommending at the time of his method, which is published in 1803. So it's very interesting that she's, she's playing on that, um, to me, anyway. But, so... Ultimately, I looked at, I went for the booklet to actually figure out what instrument exactly she was playing on, and I was happily surprised to, to, to find that it was on already on the back of the CD. But then you think, okay, well, there's other pictures, right? And I thought, okay, I wonder who's in the orchestra um, in, this, in this recording. And I go through, and it's got a list of the, the different players, and you could see that, okay, yeah, you know, like, this, this CD is so long it was recorded so long ago in sort of my life that um it's all you know it's a little bit under half of my life ago uh so you know you don't recognize any of the names in the orchestra except for the second oboist who is playing first oboe in this in the project that i was just in and then the two of course in the donzi uh, concerti there are bassoon um t parts for orchestra members i don't know how to how to say that better but there are actually three bassoonists required, the soloist and then bassoon one and two, uh, for who are playing in the orchestra. And bassoon one is Lorenzo Alpert, and bassoon two is Georgi Farkas. And these are not names that I, you know, I would expect anybody to, to, to know uh, or to recognize. So certainly the people in the historical scene who may watch this, they will go, ah, yeah, I know who that is. But what I found interesting was that I really felt in that moment like I was part of a, a continuation, like a part of something which which uh, doesn't stop. And that's not to say the Kölner Academy will go on forever. And it's also a freelance-based orchestra. You know, like I'll have I'll have one certainly one more project with them, but I'm you know I may never get called back. Whatever. Um, and it's not like you know, like the Cleveland Orchestra, the Philadelphia Orchestra, or the Berliner uh, Philharmonie, or something like that, where you have, you have this, you know, there's probably a plaque somewhere on a wall with who was first bassoon in, you know, 1900 until 1931, and, and first bassoon from 32 until whatever, you know, it's not like you're part of this 
unending thing. But in early music, we're all freelance based. And so, it, you know, it's it's sometimes interesting to see a sort of, I, I hesitate to call Culinary Academy a, an institution, but it's been making, if you go onto their Spotify uh, account and you just look at the discography, you'll see that there's just this unending list of CDs that they've recorded over the last 20 years or so. And it's interesting to, to somehow be reminded that you're a part of something bigger, regardless of this particular orchestra or something like that. But it, that was interesting. And, and I only got that because there was a physical booklet. And this is where I'm, I'm trying to circle back, circle the wagons back to the bigger, the broader point. And that is, you know, you people lamented in the 90s and the two, early 2000s that the CD booklet was so prohibitive because when you had an LP, like a real LP, the booklet for that was huge. Like you had so much physical space to write what you want. And I, I remember being in university, which had uh, Carleton University, which had a, a huge LP collection of early music from like the 1970s and 80s. And, or, yeah, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And they had incredible, like, you could pull out and it would be, you know, um, uh, Harnoncore or, or some some big early music group that, you know, Leonhard, Gustav Leonhard, um performance or recording. And they'd have this booklet and you could, you you know, even though it's a whole, you know, the orchestra might have like 30, 40 people in it, um, they would list their names, their what instrument they played and who made the instruments because they had the space in the LP uh, format to, to give you, to just give you information um, that may not be relevant to the common denominator, the co like the most common listener, but to someone who m might just be curious, well, well, they have the space, so why not? Let's write it down as well. And I thought that was interesting. I, I mean, I remember specifically look, seeing a historical player who I know to be playing on a copy now, um, an Eichentopf by Peter de Koning, and he was playing on a like an original English bassoon, I think a Millhouse bassoon, and it must have been like the f in the, in this LP recording, you know, way 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 back, and it must have been you know the f the first instrument they ever played possibly, um, but that was just. It, and it wasn't like they were playing a con concerto or anything where th this is the um in this cd of jane's the only information about any instrument we get to read is about her instrument and she's the soloist but we don't get to find out what the rest of the orchestra is doing because there isn't enough space in the booklet to put that information um so uh, you know i find that really that element to making an album if that makes sense. I think there is, you know, like we're always going to, you know, things are going to change, but there is a, pr there is some thought of course, which will go into an album also because we ha we're time limited, like 80 minutes is as, as fat is as much as we can stuff into a CD, um, into that format. But, and so you, you do have to be, you, you can be creative or, you can put some thought into uh, an, a musical, an artistic argument, or um, just a document, uh, it, a documentation of something that you're interested in, which can fit into 80 minutes. Um, but the information, what you may be trying to show, or what you may be trying to inform people, which is, is or more information which is required to help the listener, that all gets lost in streaming platforms. Um, maybe not in Naxos Music Library, but that's not, you know, we don't all have a subscription to that. And that's just something I, I felt like it was important for me to put this out there and say, you know, like I, I just had this moment that I was not intending to have in any way. Someone gave me a CD which reminded me, you know, like I really like the CD, and I just thought, hey, what the hell, let's just open up the this booklet and you know it it really made a positive impact on me on my day um which 
had I just listened on Spotify, which I always do now, um, it wouldn't have been nearly as meaningful to me personally because it it affected, you know, like how I perceive my own career. And of course, you know, I'm a musician. I'm a, I'm, and I, and this is my area of work, but I, I think we are losing something if we're, if we head in the direction of let's just put out tracks online and then people can listen to it. Then I, I think we actually, we, we are losing something not of just the experience but of we're we're losing something some deeper connection to the people um who are in the process in that artistic process i don't know if that means anything to you and i don't expect many people to take uh you know any really useful information from this but i thought i would put it out there because i do think you know the this is something that we're all, whether actively or unconsciously, we are all thinking about what is the what is the future of recording, because you know even even by the time this was recorded in two thousand six, you know the idea of receiving a royalty check was sort of over by then, and certainly today we're the ones who we are the customer, the performers are the customer of the label and not the audience. Um, we're the one who, who put up the cash, and we're the ones who have to sell the CD if we intend to get any money back in, in the end. But there's certainly no idea of royalties. So I, it just goes into this mix of, of the thought process um, behind whether maybe one should or should not make an album. Thanks for listening. Take it easy. Bye-bye.